exciting research at the University of Cambridge is using the MRI scanner to see how the mind works. Robert, hello. Nice to see you. In the scanner next door is a willing volunteer I've never met. I want you to face this way. All right, and not to look in the window. Don't look in the window. So I can't see your subject. By asking some simple yes or no questions, I'm going to try to find out a bit about him or her. If the person in the scanner is trying to convey a yes, you're going to see a bright red area of activity around his premotor cortex, the supplementary the motor area, right at the top in the middle of the head, yeah. If the person in the scanner is trying to convey a no, um, what you'll see is the same area of the brain will be lighting up, but it'll be a, a blue-greeny colour. Are you a man? There you go. I'm pretty confident that this person is conveying a yes at this stage. Are you over six foot high? He's now got a green area, so this is a this is signalling a no answer, which would mean a, a, that actually this person, this man, is not six foot high. He's shorter than six foot. We can't actually see the brain think yes or no. That would be too difficult even for an MRI machine. What our volunteer was asked to do was to imagine playing tennis when he wants to say yes. And when he does, the area of the brain which deals with movement, his motor cortex, shows increased activity. And that is easy for the MRI to see. And this is our last question. Do you have facial hair? Again, a uh, pretty obvious activation. I would say that this guy's either got a beard or a moustache. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Robert Winston, how do you do? Well, you're certainly not six foot high, that's, you got that right. One recent study using this technique has given us an insight into communication with some patients in what was thought to be a permanent vegetative state. We've seen a patient recently, a road traffic injury, who'd actually been in that situation for five years, uh, and he was able to use this technique to convey yes and no responses to us. It's certainly not, not the case for all patients, but we, we now know there are a, a subgroup of these patients who probably can do more than we think they can. It's quite scary, isn't it? Don't you think, do you not find that really quite, um, quite amazing, but also sort of very on the edge of, of, of our humanity, isn't it? It is. I mean, it, it is something that, that many people find um, you know, quite difficult to, to think about the idea that you could be trapped inside your, your body and unable to communicate. And, you know, hopefully, we've found a way that some of these patients can, can get around that, uh, get around that mm. issue. And essentially what you're measuring is changes in blood flow. We're basically looking at the areas of the brain that are working hardest. They're drawing blood, which is delivering mm -hmm. uh, oxygen, uh, and that's what we're measuring. I mean, I couldn't look at somebody with this machine and say, he thinks I'm a complete moron. No, I mean, that might be true, but at least you won't know that. That's a good thing. <laughs> Undoubtedly, the MRI machine has been the most important way of seeing how our brain works, and that alone qualifies it as one of the most significant advances in the last 50 years. But what really makes it stand out for me is its extraordinary ability to transform lives through its use in medicine. 17-year-old Ellis Westrip has had severe epilepsy since she was 11, and MRI scans have recently revealed that the seizures are due to a brain tumour. This bright area here is the area that is abnormal. What we need to do now is to determine how close that area to be removed is to parts that carry out vital functions. Though it's been decided that the tumour can be removed, the bad news is that it's dangerously close to her optic nerve. The operation carries the risk of partial blindness. But for Ellis, it's a risk worth taking. I'm trying to forget the risks and just think positive what's going to... the good things about having the surgery. I feel I'm going to get better. I can change my life back to how it was before. The epilepsy got so bad, I decided to leave school early because I couldn't cope anymore. I just... I got upset a lot that I was different. It did change my life a lot. The tumour is buried five centimetres into Ellis's brain. 
In the past, patients undergoing this operation would have run a significant risk of suffering brain damage. But thanks to MRI, the risk to Ellis is greatly reduced. In a new use of MRI, the scans are mapped onto an image seen in the surgeon's microscope, and that will help him navigate past the healthy brain to remove the tumour, which is shown as a dotted line. After nearly five hours of surgery, the tumour is finally removed. The specimen that's come out so far, the front sort of four centimetres of the temporal pole, which is exactly where the brain tumour is. I think the brain tumour is just in this bit here, right at the very bottom. And then Ellis is scanned again to ensure that none of the tumour remains. The pictures look amazing, fantastic. Two months later, and I'm off to visit Ellis on her 18th birthday. Hello, happy birthday. Some flowers for you. I'm delighted to see that she's made a full recovery. It's amazing that only a few weeks ago, before the operation, she was having up to eight seizures a day. Are you having any seizures at all? None. None at all. It has really changed your life, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's miraculous to see how the surgeon's skill and MRI technology has totally transformed Ellis's life. The past 50 years has seen innovation, invention and discovery on an unprecedented scale. I'm choosing what I think are the very best, the top 10 scientific advances of the past half century. So far, we've seen how the pill has revolutionized women's and indeed everybody's lives. We've looked at the almost miraculous effect of the microchip on, well, more or less everything. And we've marveled at our godlike ability to peer into the mind thanks to MRI scanning. There are still seven of my top ten to come. And after the program, you'll get a chance to vote on which is your favorite the best of the best. Meanwhile, on with the list. My fourth choice, which though rather familiar, has the potential to save the planet. Well, I certainly wouldn't be without this. It's one of my favorite inventions. It's the electric torch. But the great advance in the use of light came 50 years ago with the invention of the laser, which concentrates the light down a very narrow beam very precisely. It's the greatest advance in the technology of light since mankind lit its first candle. A laser produces light that's so concentrated it can burn, cut and destroy. From the very beginning this destructive power has sparked the imagination of science fiction writers. He has chosen his own death. But the force can also be used for good and that's why it's in my top 10. Here's a laser of the power of one watt, and if you don't want to use your energy to strike your match, you can just hold it in the beam of light. A one watt laser can light a match. Imagine then the power of a 500 trillion watt laser. That's exactly what they've built here at the National Ignition Facility in California, where engineers have just finished constructing the laser to end all lasers. In fact, 192 of the world's most powerful lasers, all focused on a tiny hydrogen target. If they can be made to strike at the same time, and when I say at the same time, I mean within one billionth of a second, then the energy inside the atoms will be released, creating in one moment 500 times more energy than the entire American national grid. This incredible energy release is from nuclear fusion.
What is fusion power? Well, fusion power is what's going on inside the sun, right? You know, and that is when we crush hydrogen together, we get this fusion to happen, we turn mass into energy, and that energy comes out, and if we can collect it and turn it into electricity, that's what we want to power our civilization. That's fusion power. That's what we hope to make happen in this target chamber. What is so exciting about this energy? We have no issue of pollution, and we have no issue of global climate warming. That is the dream. That has always been the dream of fusion energy, and, and hopefully we'll be able to do it here. And no nuclear waste, of course. And no nuclear waste, right. And I just know that in this facility in the next couple of years, hopefully one, we will find out that we can do it. Effectively within this chamber, Ed and his colleagues are trying to create and capture the power of a star by fusing protons in an atom, a source of energy so powerful that if it could be harnessed, it would provide the holy grail of cheaper, cleaner, renewable energy and reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. What's utterly extraordinary is that all this energy that you're generating from this vast machine is actually in that. Right. Just show me that little capsule. That capsule is where the hydrogen fuel resides. And it resides there at near absolute zero. And the laser light comes in and it heats up this can. When the shell explodes, that hydrogen implodes at nearly one and a half million kilometers per hour. And that's how we get that fusion to happen. The idea of using the laser to solve one of the great problems of physics, the production of green energy which might save the planet using nuclear fusion, that seems to be a really important reason for developing lasers. It's interesting to remember that when lasers were invented, no one imagined how many uses we'd have for them. It's unfortunate but true that war is when we make some of our greatest advances. And my next owes much to conflict. I was in southern Afghanistan, on patrol at night, and stepped on an IED. I remember seeing the flash, the feeling of going through the air, landing, and I got blown about 15 feet away from the lads. I knew what happened straight away because I checked myself, checked if I still got all my fingers on my hands, and I got to my leg and I thought, no, oh, that ain't there. Fair enough. And I checked my other leg and that was bleeding badly, all shattered bones and everything else. So I knew that probably wouldn't be there when I woke up. <laughs> there you go. Until recently, Sam would never have walked again. But now the science of biomechanics is getting closer than ever before to mimicking the complexity and sophistication of our own bodies. At Headley Corp Military Rehabilitation Centre, doctors are helping hundreds of injured soldiers like Sam. Sam, when were you injured? Um, beginning of August. So you're already walking? Yep. I mean, that's what, five months? About that, yeah. Which is rather impressive. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, has that been a massive effort for you? Presumably it must have been. Um, more of a challenge, really. I've been trying to beat some power for friends of mine, mm. so... Do you compete amongst yourselves? Yeah, there's a lot of competition between us. Who can be up quickest? Because being soldiers, you tend to be competitive anyway. Absolutely, definitely. Yeah. The amazing thing about Sam's artificial legs is that they're controlled by a computer. Where is the computer in this? Thing? Right, it's just actually behind the knee joint here. In the shin, we've got some strain gauges, and they give uh, 50 readings per second back to the computer, which then regulates the hydraulics. And that's really what makes this knee so stable in normal walking. In the early days, uh, an injury like this would have resulted in what for Sam? He'd have probably been sat in a wheelchair for, the, for most of his life. Now he spends pretty much all his time up on his legs, walking about. So, so it's yeah. really life-changing. Absolutely, yeah. 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 There isn't any 